the minimum wage, if you will, is not keeping up with the cost of living, and it's going to, you know, people become angry. Uh, there's, there's no way, clear path for them to basically have a better life, and that's not good for anybody. All right, Mr. Peter Doyle, welcome to On the Margin. Thanks for having me, Michael. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, Viewers would have missed this, but I'm not sure uh, anyone has ever had to work so hard uh, for an interview uh, for all these technical challenges that we we solved together uh, with the help of our fearless editor, uh, Evan. Uh, So thanks so much for for wading through that. Uh, We'll try to make it worth it for you. Happy to do it. Yeah. Um, Awesome. I've got a ton of questions for you. Uh, Before we dive in, can you just give like a quick... 30 second minute type background on who you are, what you're doing at Horizon Kinetics, kind of all that good stuff. Sure. Um, so growing up as a kid, I had an interest in money primarily because my family didn't have a lot. Um, and yep. for me, uh, very early on, money was a chance to buy freedom. Um, so I got into the financial industry as a result of basically hoping to make money for myself. Um, I joined a company called Bankers Trust Company uh, that ultimately got acquired by Deutsche Bank. Worked there for a decade, met a group of people that are uh, great, smart, hardworking people. We left there in 1994, started a company called Horizon Asset Management. Uh, two years later, I started a second firm called, uh, co-founded a second firm called Kinetics Asset Management. Uh, ultimately, we merged those two companies and the combined entity is called Horizon Kinetics today. And we manage about $7 billion and been working with the same people for 30 plus years now. Um, good, good people, hardworking people, brilliant pe- people. Um, so it's been a great experience. You guys do great work there too. Um, I want to, I want to start this interview actually and transport you back uh, about 12 or, or 18 months. Uh, so I heard you in previous interviews talk about how you guys were positioned uh, going into March of 2020, being net short volatility. Um, the way you described it is, you know, you're, you're kind of in this position where like, oh God, this trade is going against me. I'm in this, I'm uh, getting shellacked here. And you start to kind of deleverage or, or unwind that position. But that's around the same time that the Fed steps in and kind of puts a floor on the market. Now, a lot of people would have the uh, have the reaction of, oh, wow, well, thanks for that free gimme. I'm going to go on and live my life. Your actual quote was, it was at that moment that I started to question the world of capitalism uh, that you had never done before. Talk to me a little bit. Why was that your reaction when the Fed stepped in and did that? So that was largely a personal trade. Um, We did have a little bit of that on professionally. Um, I didn't have any of it on professionally. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, part of it is, is that you're you're in a market system and you're making, you're trying to do good analysis and you're making your bets and you're going to have great bets. You're going to have average bets. You're going to have some losers. So that trade was turning very rapidly into a losing bet. I thought longer term, if I had the staying power, it would be a good trade. But if things really went awry, which they looked like they were going awry, it really could have had a devastating impact on my portfolio. So I decided to close out the position. And as I was deleveraging my portfolio, this Fed stepped in and they basically gave me a rescue line. That's not how capitalism is supposed to work. It's supposed to be that I made a bet, I got it wrong, I take the hit and I, and I move on. So I don't think it's healthy for, for the overall market. And I don't think it washes out the excesses that need to be washed out. And I didn't feel comfortable with that happening. And what I really came to appreciate was that if you had financial assets and you were had the ability to hang on, you did very well during a economic crisis uh, caused by the pandemic. And it created a lot more wealth inequality in the world, in, particularly in the United States. And I don't think that's good for society. So even though it benefited me, benefited me personally, um, I'd rather it have not benefited me, me personally and be better for society. Yeah. Well, that's a mature, I mean, a, a lot of people uh, would have another reaction. So kudos to you. Um, I, you know, one, one thing that we've talked about on this program before is the idea of financial risk taking being sort of different from other types of risk taking in the sense that uh, like usually kind of confined to the banking sector. So uh, be- because credit in a, in a sense is a public utility. So I, as a co-founder of BlockWorks, if I decide to take on a lot of risk and I mess that up, then the company can go bankrupt and shame on me. If banks take on a whole lot of risk uh, and they take on too much and they mess up, they can actually, there can be big ripple effects that will affect other businesses that are depending on the credit 
that banks offer. It's a little bit different when you think about that within the context of asset managers. And, you know, you kind of described the situation where the Fed stepped in and gave you a bit of a bailout, but largely as well, like when the pandemic was first kind of coming on and the Fed stepped in and kind of bailed out the airlines, right? And, you know, it, the point was made that, look, if you didn't bail out the airlines, they would continue to function. They'd go through the bankruptcy process, some jobs would be lost, uh, it would change hands, but ultimately planes would still fly. And so really who you're bailing out there is the equity shareholders. Um, do you agree with that assessment? And if so, wh- what are the like social ramifications of bailing out equity holders in a capitalist system? Yeah, I think you bail out the equity shareholders and I think you bail out the senior management. Mm-hmm. The, the workers themselves would have gotten picked up. It would have gone through a bankruptcy process and they still need the employees to run the airline, if, depending on who ends up with the planes. And those people would have been hired back on by another company. And the executive would have been out of work. So if you look at the actions of the airlines pre-pandemic crisis, they were taking their cash flow and they were not saving for a rainy day. They were buying back stock and, and doing things that were not prudent for managing your financial risk. So I was not a big fan of that action by the government. And I think ultimately it's not good for society that that occurred. Yeah, absolutely. I um, there, there's that. What's that expression? It's like uh, uh, capitalism without bankruptcy is uh, like religion without hell. It just doesn't really work if you don't have the negative incentive there. Um, can, can you talk? What is it? Because that that wasn't always the case, right? We didn't always have um, either a central bank or a government that would step in whenever there was a hiccup and essentially offer free money to everyone. So how do we kind of go down this road? Or what were the big impact? What were the big factors that led to kind of where we are now, which it seems like every time there's a 20 or 30 percent correction, the monetary and fiscal guns kind of step in. Yeah, I I think, you know, with hindsight, and I probably didn't recognize it the way I should have, I think it started under the uh, Federal Reserve under Alan Greenspan, and there was a Greenspan put. Um, And I think that the markets came to realize the Federal Reserve would basically step in and take action that they needed to. You saw it with the long term capital. You saw it with Asian crisis. Um, So I think the the lesson that people learn was that I can take on a lot of risk. And if things start to unwind, I'm going to get helped out. And I think you really saw that during the pandemic. I mean, they just ramped up money printing, uh, fiscal policy, et cetera, um, that was going to help smooth this out for people. And I think ultimately, it's not good for anybody. Yeah, absolutely. What uh, actually, could, could you remind me, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I've got somewhere on this bookshelf behind me, the uh, Lowenstein book, uh, When Genius Failed. Uh, but the Asian currency crisis, I'm not as familiar on. What what was that? And how did the Fed kind of step it, in? And it, I'm, I'm a little fuzzy on it, but it was a Thai bot. And it, it was just going to have ripple effects on to other currencies. And um you know, they stepped in and, and provided money and backing uh, on, on that basis. Um, so I, I'm not an expert on that, but it was definitely one of the situations that, that was part of it. That wasn't my area of focus at the time. Mm-hmm. So so we've kind of got this um, this changing dynamic, right, where increasingly central banks, the Federal Reserve kind of step in and they are used to putting a floor under markets. Maybe it started in the era of Alan Greenspan. Um, I think there are kind of two frameworks or way to, ways to look at this. Um, on the one hand, you kind of have this growing community that vilifies central banking and points to a lot of the problems like around inequality and things like that and say, hey, this is uh, your fault as an institution. Then there's this other framework or way of looking at it where you say, actually, you know, there are certain kind of growth expectations that are built into society. You can observe that most directly with pensions, right? They have a certain target that they need to meet. Uh, ultimately, we haven't really had much growth. So really what central banks are kind of doing is trying to hold everything together. If you can't get organic growth, you can at least debase the currency and that's palliative. Where, What framework do you kind of look at central banks falling into? So... so- I mean, I, I'm not exactly sure how how to answer that. Um, you know, I, I think there was a time where taking on debt and helping society grow was not necessarily a bad thing. Mm-hmm. But I think that they largely should be an invisible hand and let the markets play out and not intercede and, and step in when uh, when there's a crisis. And I think somewhere along the way, they lost that. And I think that there's it's kind of like a lot of society where people are not allowed to lose. Everyone gets a, a trophy for participation, et cetera. 
And I think to make markets work properly, you need people to fail and you need companies to fail and people make misallocations of capital. And if you reward that misallocate allocation of capital by keeping those businesses uh, in business, that's that's not good for anybody. So I think what really happened is that the bankers just became too dominant in their actions and are rigging the market in a lot of ways. And it's not healthy. Yeah, I would I would agree with that as well. Um, so, so obviously, one of the ramifications of the continued involvement of bankers, central bankers, is this misallocation of capital and kind of undermining the, the mechanism of capitalism. Another worry, of course, when you start to create as much money as the central bank is arguably doing, is inflation. Uh, so I'd love to know where you kind of stand on this, uh, this debate that's really dominating finance right now of are we headed towards, are we going to continue uh, this environment of deflation that we've been living through for about the last 30 years, or are we potentially shifting towards secular inflation? So I'm, I'm in the camp that we're shifting to secular inflation. And uh, the amount of all, all of the major central banks, their policies are in complete alignment today. And they're printing up more money, uh, creating more money, going into the markets and buying securities, et cetera. And just, it's just a question of who's doing it a little bit more aggressively. And as a result of that, uh, they're creating artificial pricing. Um, so doing that in the debt market, doing that in the equity markets. And uh, when you inflate the money supply, but you don't inflate the goods and services at the same level, that's going to cause inflation. And my belief is that's what's coming. And I think they, they're well aware of it. I think the debt burden globally is so large that they really, most central banks have two choices in order to get out of that problem. It's either they default on their currency, which is really not an option for the vast majority of them, mm -hmm. or you debase your currency and hopefully nominal GDP grows in a way that basically the debt is, is now more much more manageable. And I think that's the policy that they're on. And that's going to lead to structural inflation. Mm. Uh, just as a just to play devil's advocate to that position, uh, obviously, if you, you're printing the amount of money that central banks are doing globally, it kind of feels it would be a pretty it would be a historical anomaly if we didn't move towards inflation. On the other hand, you can kind of point towards these heavily these kind of de deflationary uh, headwinds. So, like uh, demographics are very favorable for unfavorable for inflation or, or, or growth. It's really pretty deflationary. Uh, technology, all that kind of stuff. Where do you, I mean, how do you factor those arguments? Yeah, in? it's not a straight line. And I think there's going to be certain industries that experience tremendous amounts of inflation, some that are going to experience deflation, some people are going to be benefited from it, some companies are going to be benefited from it, some are going to be hurt very aggressively by it. Um, so it's, it's, you can't control it, uh, is mm -hmm. really what happens. But um, I would say overall, the deflationary uh, benefits that we've had for 30 plus years are not going to be able to offset what's going on right now. Got it. And, and I think there's a mad mini crisis being um, developed, um, and I think we're in the midst of that right now, through the lack of expenditures and exploration for hydrocarbons. And, and I think that's being driven by a whole host of factors that ultimately is going to have an impact on the prices of goods and services that you're going to be paying in the not too distant future. Yeah. I think when I, when I kind of think about inflation, I have a lot of questions, obviously, never having live through it myself. Uh, but the way I sort of bucket in my head is there are two major camps of or uh, categories of, of outcomes there. One, there's an impact on markets and the valuation of different types of assets. And then two, there are kind of these social implications of living through an inflation, uh, inflationary phase. I'd love to start with markets in general. So if I'm an investor and I'm kind of looking at things from like, oh, where am I going to store my wealth through a period of inflation? How, what's the framework that you use for approaching that problem? Yeah, that's a great question. And we put out a bunch of pieces on that uh, in the very recent past. Um, so you're looking for, as an investor, you're looking for companies that have the ability to pass along price increases, um, mm -hmm. but don't have a cost structure that basically they would be hurt by that. Um, so no good if you can raise your prices 10%, but your costs go up 12%. Right. Right. That's not, that's not a good inflation hedge. So you're looking for, um, as an investor, companies that are asset light, that can benefit from price increases that they can pass along, but there's not a cost structure that basically grows that's reflective of that inflation that you're experiencing. So, Do you have an example, just so I can, almost like a prototypical example of what would a great type of company be? For sure. So um, 
various exchanges, commodity mm-hmm. exchanges, uh, equity exchanges, etc. The amount of liquidity in the system is growing because they're printing more money, but the cost of trading more volume is really very low, right? So it's just more throughput through the same exchange. So generally, much higher volume, similar costs, more profit to the bottom line. Hmm. Other examples and great examples are royalty companies, where one of our biggest positions, a company called Texas Pacific Land Trust, which is a uh, oil and gas royalty company, uh, primarily. And if you want to drill on their land and the price of oil goes higher, they just get they cash bigger and bigger checks. There's no associated cost with that. They don't do the exploration. They don't get the permits, et cetera, the legal requirements and all of that. So that's just a, a company that potentially can grow from the drilling and activities of other uh, companies out there. Yeah. When you think about overall the companies that have done well over the past uh, decade or two, um, I mean, there is kind of like people tend to focus on CapEx and, and how much companies are reinvesting essentially into business. And a lot of the companies that have been very successful at creating value, uh, kind of the Facebooks or the Googles of the world, actually have a very low uh, CapEx spend, right? Um, so in this framework that you're talking about, and I'd love to get, <laughs> I'm, I'm almost split on how I would think about this. Because on the one hand, if you have inflation and no growth, you would kind of think that some of these growthier names, right, like the ones that have done really well in the current environment, would actually do really well in an inflationary environment because there'd be such a premium that investors would be willing to pay for growth because it's so absent that you could kind of see almost like a continuation or even getting more extreme of the current environment that we're in. That kind of tallies with what you just said about asset light businesses. On the other hand, the argument for almost more value stocks is if you don't, if people discount heavily those dollars that are being earned in the future because the value of the people don't view dollars as being very valuable, I could almost see more traditional value-oriented companies doing better. Did that make a lot of sense? I, I'm very, it's just, I don't know how to, I don't know what the proper framework is. Yeah, it, it does. And, and it's a balancing act. Um, I think what's happening is, uh, and it ties into the actions of the Federal Reserve and other central banks, um, If you're artificially keeping interest rates down to a level that's not reflective of reality, let's say the 10 years at 1.35 or 1.4, wherever it is at this moment, but the real rate, if they weren't stepping in and buying 40 plus billion dollars a month in treasuries, might be 4%. What might the discount rate be and and how you price those growthier companies might come down very substantially. So maybe Mm -hmm. they don't deserve to trade at 60 times. Maybe they deserve to trade at 40 times. And even though they might be able to grow their revenue, um, in some cases, I don't think all cases, I think the saturation for a lot of those companies is actually close to being fulfilled, um, you could actually do quite poorly in some of those names. And more traditional classical value doesn't necessarily mean, even though they might be priced more uh, attractively on historical measures, they may not be able to pass along those price increases that they experience and their cost structure may actually go higher because they have to pay their employees more. Um, So it's a very, very tricky environment. And I think what really you need to do is you need to find companies that, again, I would say that can benefit from increased scale as a result of inflation, but really don't have the the liability of uh, increasing costs as a result of inflation that's likely to come. And there's not that many names out there. Uh, that fit that profile. Yeah, absolutely not. Moving outside of equities, maybe as a hedge, um, what's, what are your kind of thoughts on more hard assets like uh, or scarce assets, kind of like real estate fits that bill, uh, certain types of precious metals, gold and silver, and then ultimately Bitcoin? What, what are your thoughts on those, that kind of bucket? So uh, I think that's a great area to look. Um, it's, it's also a question of how you do it. So, you know, there's... Um, precious metal royalty companies that I think have a fighting chance of doing well. Uh, mm-hmm. Then there's traditional uh, mining companies that I'm not that thrilled with because I think the price of energy could go up and overwhelm the cost of exploration and maybe the price of gold or silver is not going to do that well. I think silver is probably going to do better than gold. Um, then there's the chance that Bitcoin could demonetize gold. Um, so I would have exposure there, but I'm not that crazy about it. And in the case of real estate, 
I think it's case by case. It's as, it's as true of anywhere. The real estate is, you know, global local market, if you will. Um, and you might do incredibly well in certain real estate and you might get your head handed to you in other types of real estate. So you have to kind of think through the implications of all of that. Yeah. Uh, but again, if you own real estate where my, my colleague likes to describe it as a hard asset, where you own the rights to a, a royalty stream, um, but other companies are going to do all of the uh, spending and you're just going to collect that royalty stream. There's no associated cost with that. And what you talked, spoke about earlier is that the ability to use that cash flow, um, either for dividends or stock rebit buybacks, are really what creates value over a long period of time. And those are the types of companies that you, you need to be looking for. Howdy, guys. Excited to talk to you a little bit about this week's sponsor, Matrix Support. If you're like me, you're trying to figure out how can I make my crypto go as far as it possibly can. Well, Matrix Support makes it really easy to do the simple stuff like just buying and trading and you're holding your crypto on a secure platform that you don't have to worry about. But they also help you take that next step to doing things like getting loans against your crypto or earning yield on it. Let's talk about the yield part because for me, that earn feature is the most interesting thing that they do. Number one, first step you can start earning up to 30% APY on your USDC deposits. That's about 29.99% more than if you just kept those funds in a bank account. Talk about a no-brainer. Number two, their team walked me through this. They have made accessing DeFi easy. And guys, I am telling you, I am the biggest Luddite on the face of the earth. If I can understand this stuff, then I promise, so can you. So don't wait. At least go check them out. Click the link at the bottom of this episode. Thank me later. I want to return to uh, uh, Bitcoin in a little bit, but before, as we're kind of still on this topic of inflation, um, you know, wh- one of the things that you said earlier in this interview was, you know, the ramifications of kind of undermining the mechanism of capitalism, central banks stepping in and putting a floor into markets, is it's causing wealth inequality, right? Because the owners of financial assets over a period of time, great, the Fed has your back. But if you don't own any of those financial assets, that's too bad. And suddenly it's too expensive for anyone to really buy in. Um, you know, one way that people talk about inflation is, hey, what the government is going to do, they're going to inflate away the nominal value of the debt. They're going to let the economy run really hot, keep interest rates really low. Uh, suddenly people are going to wake up and their mortgage is going to look, you know, in nominal terms, it'll be the same. But because of how much incomes and everything have risen, it's not going to be as arduous. Uh, and they almost view it as this positive reset in between um, generations and income class, et cetera. How, what do you view as being the social ramifications? Uh, or how does the society fare when it goes to inflation? Yeah, so, so that there's a possibility, and that may work out that way for some people. Um, but there's you know, other people that have worked hard their whole lives and are on fixed income, and now they thought they were relatively well off, and suddenly that fixed income is not going to be able to... Um, carry them and, and meet their needs in the future. And they're not going to be able to do the things that they had hoped to do in retirement. And they're going to be potentially hurt very badly. Um, then you're going to have, you know, kind of the lower level entry jobs that where the price, um, the minimum wage, if you will, is not keeping up with the cost of living. Um, and it's going to, you know, people become angry. Um, there's, there's no way clear path for them to basically have a better life. And that's not good for anybody. So I, th- I think that's a real threat. And I think you've seen a lot of wealth inequality grow in the, in the recent past. And um, I, I think you're seeing, you know, populism grow around the world as a result of that. And I think that's a, a trend that you should be paying attention to and be concerned about. I think in general, folks tend to, when you're thinking about um, almost empires in general and how they fall, people tend to focus on external threats or exogenous shocks, because it's very easy to point to this and say, this, this, and this was the reason why this happened. But usually there's a heavy, uh, maybe even dominant internal component where the nation, just like a company, right? When people stop acting as a team and everyone starts to go out for themselves and there's almost this sense of moral decay uh, where it all kind of falls apart. And that's a harder thing to pinpoint. But I tend to draw a lot of things back to this issue that we're talking about, about Wealth, equal, wealth inequality, because ultimately you're starting to see some wacky things pop up in the social and political realm. And I, I trace a lot of that personally back to wealth inequality, which is why I think what we're talking about right now is so critically important. 
I, I agree with you, uh, uh, 100%. I think, you know, if, if, you, if people don't feel like they have a path to a better life, they become angry and disillusioned, and they take action that's not good for society. Um, and I think there's definitely that's playing out right now. Uh, and it's a trend that could get a lot worse for a lot of people. So I would, I, I'm concerned about that personally. Yeah, me too. Um, I, I want to go back to some of the thoughts that you have about uh, just Bitcoin in general. Uh, obviously, over the course of the last 12 months or so, this has become a much more institutional asset class in general. Uh, so I always value talking to someone uh, like you and, and kind of you, as a manager of money uh, and, and dealing with institutions, uh, you have kind of bring a different perspective to this space. So I'd be curious, um, what's your kind of framework for looking at this asset in general? So it's... Um... When Bitcoin was first brought to my attention in 2015 by my colleague, Murray Stahl, he laid it out in a very concise manner. And within literally 90 seconds, I said, I want in. Mm -hmm. nice. And as I've studied it more and read books and thought about it and philosophically how important it might be for the world, my view as from an investment standpoint really hasn't changed radically from that first 90 seconds. Bitcoin to me is verifiable digital scarcity. And the demand for it is going to grow. And the supply is not going to grow or it's going to grow. It's capped and people know what the ultimate supply is going to be. And as a result of that, the value of single Bitcoin, I think, has the potential to go up exponentially from here. So it's probably the greatest risk reward asset that I've ever seen in my lifetime. And I think it has fundamental implications that could change the way we live our lives. And, and I'm very pro that. But from an investment standpoint, it still comes down to supply and demand ultimately over the long term. And the supply is capped. Demand is going to continue to grow. That's going to be reflected in a much higher price for, the, uh, for a Bitcoin. Yeah. Um, you, in a previous interview, there's been a lot of focus and comparison between Bitcoin and gold. As an asset, and that makes sense because the popular narrative is Bitcoin being, uh, or yeah, digital gold. But I, the comparison that I'm particularly more interested in is actually uh, in the bond market uh, and how the growth of Bitcoin might actually impact uh, allocation from moving from bonds into Bitcoin. So you actually kind of talked about there's there being this arbitrage uh, opportunity, or you know it exists, but it might not necessarily. Like, how do you, in your mind, how is the the bond market and Bitcoin? generally connected. So the way I look at bonds right now, unless you're an excellent trader, it's it's an asset class with all risk, no return. Um, so I would be shifting, you know, if you're traditional 60-40, that 40% is likely to get a negative rate of return looking out over the next 10 years or more. Um, so I would have virtually none in fixed income right now. And Bitcoin can, you don't need a, a big exposure uh, to offset uh, that negative return that you might get in fixed income. So I would definitely have some exposure to Bitcoin, whether it's 2%, 5%, whatever you're, you're comfortable with. Um, but that's really the, that's really the crux of the issue. The, the fixed income market is, is and, and the equity market is overpriced, but the fixed income market in particular, I don't see how, other than if you know how to trade in, in a week to week or month to month, how you can possibly make money in fixed income. And that's, we're talking hundreds of trillions of dollars of wealth that are tied up in that. And that's that's going to go somewhere. Do you think, I mean, because one of the reasons why, uh, I guess there are a bunch of reasons why folks are still invested in fixed income in general. Um, you know, if you're a, lo a long term or a big institutional allocator like an insurance company and you're trying to match up your assets and your liabilities like they do, there is some advantage, right, to having known cash streams extending 10, 20, 30 years out into the future. There are also just mandates as well from like folks who raised money on the premise that I am going to earn alpha uh, investing in bonds. So I get how it takes a long period of time for money to move out of uh, asset classes. In, in general, do you see a mass exodus of capital out of bonds? Do you think folks are going to line up with your way of thinking? Do you think that 
just because of the way uh, capital is almost structured in the institutional world, it's going to stick around. How, how do you just view bonds as an, as an asset moving forward? Sure. The, and, and, and you're 100% right. I mean, there's there are mandates and there's going to be people that are continue to invest in fixed income. But if you're looking to capture a return and you're looking to outrun inflation and you're the tr- you know typical investor, fixed income is not the place to be looking right now. Um, mm-hmm. unless you have like one off or unique situations. But if you're buying a 30 year bond or a 10 year bond and you're hoping to get a proper rate of return on that, good luck with that. Um, so that money should be moving away from it and should be not only moving away from it, should be moving away from it at warp speed, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. So it's again, I think it's all risk, no return. Got it. Um, all right. I've got a couple of questions for you about, uh, Bitcoin. So you said some, um, I, and I heard you on previous interviews as well, definitely very bullish on what the future of this asset could be. I, just to level set uh, with you as well, I am the co-founder of a media company that is heavily focused in this space. Um, as a disclaimer, I own a, a bunch of Bitcoin personally. Um, I am, I would call myself a Bitcoiner, although not a Bitcoin maxi. Uh, that being said, I am very curious. I do have a couple of questions. I think if you were to only follow Bitcoin in the media, you'd essentially be focused on all the wrong questions. But I do have a list of questions that I tend to think about that I don't think have a great answer to them. And I'd love to just get your opinions of almost like devil advocate type questions on Bitcoin. Um, So a little while ago, someone showed this chart um, on Twitter and it was basically tracking gold and every other major asset class over a period of 100 years. So it was like gold, they had bonds, uh, you know, uh, corporate bonds, they had sovereign bonds, they had... uh, uh, you know, commodity index, uh, equities, all that kind of stuff. Gold underperforms everything um, over basically any time period, unless you're going to, you know, cherry pick like the 40s or the 70s. And initially when I saw that, I thought to myself, well, why does anyone own gold then? But then it kind of occurred to me, gold is money. It's there to protect your uh, your purchasing power. And it also sets a hurdle rate, right? You ultimately want your productive assets to outperform whatever the hurdle rate of just owning and holding your money is. And when we're talking about Bitcoin as an asset, it strikes me that we're talking about the same thing. We're talking about creating this sound, this ultrasound money. And you could actually kind of see it that if Bitcoin is successful, it shouldn't keep doing what it's doing right now. Do you know what I mean? Like, how, how do you think I, about I do, I do. I do know what you mean. And I, and I think that at some point, Bitcoin is going to get to a price where it will not appreciate. It will only appreciate relative to how other currencies debase okay. themselves on an annual basis. But I think we're a long way off from that. So, you know, the market capitalization of Bitcoin today is roughly $750 billion. Mm-hmm. That's not even 40% of the market cap of Apple. That's not a, you know, that's not a fair comparison because they're two different things. But it's just it's so small relative to the total asset size and the uh, nominal stores of value that, that are out there uh, that it could basically at least mirror or have a similar valuation with. Um, so we're in the very early stages of that. But ultimately, once Bitcoin has a market capitalization of, let's say, hundreds of trillions of dollars, it's not going to appreciate uh, in the same way. Mm. Now, do you see in this future, uh, like however Bitcoin ends up functioning as a monetary asset, uh, do you see Bitcoin almost being like the yardstick? Do you think things will be denominated in Bitcoin sats or whatever it is going forward at some point uh, in the future? Real possibility. I, I do, actually. I think that's a real possibility. I think yeah. there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of reasons why that could and should happen. And, you know, whether it's it's pricing oil, maybe people don't want to hold dollars anymore. They want a, a more neutral standard for that. It could be that ships over to Bitcoin or Satoshi's. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's a real possibility. Yeah, um, uh, yeah that's that's great. Um, next line of questioning, I guess, is, you know, if you think back to history, um, there's a reason why I, I think Bitcoin is a superior asset to gold uh, in a lot of ways. Um, but, you know, Gold still did function for a period of time as a global money, right? And a lot of what folks talk about uh, Bitcoin acting as a speed speed bump, basically, on for central banks or, or governments so that they don't overspend. Uh, we kind of had that a little bit in the gold system, the Bretton Woods system, etc. Those systems failed uh, for for basically the reason that governments don't abide by those speed bumps, and they'll kind of lie, cheat, and steal their way out of uh, and put themselves in debt and do all this stuff. So what would you say to the idea that like we've almost tried something like the Bitcoin system before and it's failed because it's counter to human nature? 
So we tried it because it was in the hands of humans, and this is in the hands of alg uh, algorithms and mathematics. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a much more neutral system. This is a much, much better system. Um, so you're absolutely right. They can change the rules, and the elites, the bankers, et cetera, change the rules, and they wanted to spend more, and they wanted to fund wars or whatever they wanted to do, and they took us off a standard that was probably better for society. Um, here, that's not an option. People can't do that. Banks can't do that. Um, just again, to carry this to its like ultimate conclusion here, if you look at World War II, right, uh, where there was kind of some gold, gold standard going into it, what happened is obviously nations are at war, they need to fight, and arguably a lot of Europe really bankrupted itself uh, fighting this war. So I guess in the future, this is just a governance decision, right? Like a trade-off. So in, in a Bitcoin kind of system, if a government wants to go to war, needs to go to war to protect itself, et cetera, the option seems to be uh, going to massive debt. Um, do you view that as a, I mean, A, do you agree with that premise? And B, is that just a more desirable thing than governments being able to debase willy-nilly? Do you just see it as a trade-off? I, I think it's a trade-off, but I think it, it may be... Uh... They, they won't be able to fund wars in the same way. Uh, maybe mm. it's a good thing for ultimately for society that's saying, hey, you know what, that's not where we want to, the population says that's not where we're going to allocate our resources and that's not what we're, we're willing to do here. So um, I think Bitcoin has the potential to make the world a better and safer place from that standpoint. Yeah, that's also, also very possible um, as well. Because I think we're dealing with something that's never really been fully seen before. In general, no, we we haven't. This is this is an incredible invention, incredible technology. Um, you know, I'm rooting for it. For the, I think I think it really could bring discipline and and more rational thought and and, and behavior to financial uh, markets around the world. And it's not corruptible uh, in that way. So, yeah, it, it's it's incredibly exciting. Mm -hmm. When you think about what makes uh, Bitcoin so interesting, there are a lot of different almost uh, ideas that kind of get toted around. There's this idea of being uh, permissionless. Uh, there's this idea of being uncensorable, uh, fully decentralized, uh, etc. What is it about the innovation around Bitcoin that first grasped you and you're kind of most excited about? So, um, and again, initially it was, there is this scarcity and you have this potential for this thing to be monetized and enter a monet become a monetary asset um, in, in a way that was never available before. Um, so that that still hasn't changed from an investment standpoint. So I think the potential to make a lot of money in Bitcoin is still exciting. But what it means for society and potentially wealth inequality and destruction of humankind through wars, et cetera, et cetera it might actually improve that and allow for basically people to live in, in on a better standard of living in a more peaceful environment uh, globally. So it's it's exciting on a lot of philosophical levels uh, as well. And that's become more much more exciting. And that's why personally rooting for it, if I never made a dime from Bitcoin from here going forward, I'd be incredibly happy as long as it fulfilled its promise. Yeah, I, I think one of the interesting uh you know, additions that you kind of bring to the space as well as you're, you've described yourself as a, as a value investor, which is uh, not something that's super typical uh, of folks who are involved in this space or proponents of Bitcoin. One of the hardest things, at least for me, trying to explain to people in my social circle about Bitcoin is, well, what gives it any value? There's no cash flow coming from it. How do you as a value investor think about doing something like valuing Bitcoin? So it's it's not it's not a productive asset, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it does have value because people choose to basically create it through the mining process, the expenditure of energy, et cetera. So I think from that standpoint, it should have value um, because people are willing to trade fiat currency, energy, et cetera, to, to create this and bring it into existence. My own belief is that it's it's a relative asset. And the same way the euro is compared to the dollar or the yen is compared to the dollar. And if you believe this new relative asset is a better store of value than your existing currencies, then there shouldn't be an arbitrage between the two. Um, and Bitcoin should have a value relative to all of the other nominal stores of value out there. So all of the dollars, all of the yens, all the short term treasuries, et cetera. 
And that number is a staggering number. And I think that's the potential from a monetization standpoint of Bitcoin. And that's the potential upside in Bitcoin from a from a financial gain standpoint. And I, I guess last uh, last question for you here, and then we can uh, start to wrap things up is overall, um, I agree that there's a lot of problems that we that we currently have, right? I, I, I completely subscribe to the idea that what central banks are de- doing are basically debasing currency and, and kind of uh, governments are co-opting people's time and energy. Um, on the other hand, we, the system that we live in is people in, in, in some sense as well. Uh, so what I definitely don't want to do is see everything kind of crash and burn, right? So how do you think about this a period of transition, right? Let's say at some point in, in the future, um, undetermined, you know, people are kind of pricing uh, things in sats or Bitcoin or however they're doing it. Um, but h- how do we get from point A to point B? And do you see a world where kind of fiat and Bitcoin coexist or does, is it all, how, what does that transition look like? Uh, yeah, I, d- I do. I don't think governments around the world are going to give up their currencies. I think you're going to have a digital dollar, digital yen, digital euro, etc. Um, and and I don't think the vast majority of people around the world are going to make a lot of money in, in Bitcoin. Um, but it might be a sense where Bitcoin becomes, if you want to, you know, have a store of value and protect yourself against the potential de- continued debasement of whatever particular country you live in, you keep the your savings in Bitcoin, and when you want to spend, you convert into a, a fiat currency. Um, so that's not inconceivable to me. Um, that's likely. And, um, you know, how, how it plays out and whether or not there's going to be fits and starts and violence that are associated with it, um, that remains to be seen. Um, in an ideal world, uh, you know, it plays out smoothly. Um uh, they continue to debase and they debase in a way that most people don't understand it and they are comfortable with the way things are unfolding for them. Um, and ultimately, the nominal GDP is, is so large that it basically the debt problem goes away um, or is, is, is cured. So we'll see how that plays out. No, I don't know if anyone knows that. Certainly not me. <laughs> no, um, I was hoping you would yeah, have some ideas, yeah. but it's an unknowable <laughs> thing. Right? It's not it's really. A, it's an unknowable thing. I, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, we, we, we have this conversation a lot internally. It's really the administrative state versus the individual that's going on. That's, that's the primary fight that's going on out there. And I think that Bitcoin gives the individual a big leg up. Um, and it gives them potentially a lot of freedom, um, and not being controlled in the same way. And, and and, and just it gives you a lot of sovereignty in, in sense of uh, your ability, if you want in the future, if you're able to accept digital micropayments um, and somebody wants to market to you or advertise to you. It used to be that a handful of companies made the money. Maybe now you as an individual make that money because you say, you know what, if you want to send me a particular, show me a particular type of furniture, I'm willing to see your ads, but you're going to have to pay me X number of dollars. That technology is available to us now. Um, so it may be a shift away for a lot of um, towards the individual and away from uh, companies as a result of that. And that's I think that's going to be very interesting and very positive for society. Yeah, I mean, it really does open up the financial uh, system in general, which I didn't understand this as fully until I started paying attention to this space. But finance uh, has moved over time from being an open system to a closed one. And when you deposit your money in virtually any institution where you'd hold your money, be it a brokerage or a bank, you don't actually maintain ownership of those assets anymore. Instead, what you have is an IOU from that brokerage. Um, and that's just very different. Like one thing that I've learned as a, as a small business uh, owner is possession really is nine tenths of the law. And, you know, someone doesn't pay you something like that. Good luck. Good luck. You know? Uh, go through the court system. And I, I just think the the implications of moving ownership uh, back to the individual and opening up the financial ecosystem, uh, you know, through, be it through Bitcoin or other uh, kind of DeFi, uh, you know, technologies, that's just really profound. And it's going to create a whole bunch of different emergent use cases that are really difficult to predict now. But I think it's a really, really might be the most profound shift of my lifetime. Actually. It's, no question. It's, it is the most profound profound uh, shift in my lifetime and and you can see that coming and and that's that's the excitement of it i agree 
Um, we did this, we did this interview with a guy named Dan Tapiero, um, of 10 T holdings. He also worked with a bunch of, uh, pretty famous macro fund managers. And, and he said, you know, we did this interview a couple months after the, the depths of the pandemic and like, you know, we did it in July or something. And he said this thing that really stuck with me. He's like, this is going to be the most in- interesting time to be an investor that I've ever seen. And that was the time it was very doom and gloom. And, you know, people were really concerned and it just really stuck out to me because, um, I, you know, I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about it like that. And I was pretty nervous, but I think there's definitely some hardships to kind of figure out and go through, but I agree. I'm pretty optimistic about the future right now. Yeah. There's, there's amazing technologies on the horizon and, 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 you know, there's, there's a lot to be concerned about, but there's also a lot of positive things that have gone on the standard of living around the world, people's life ex- expectancies up until very recently been trending in the right direction. Um, so stand, you know, Poverty rates have gone down globally. So, you know, there's there's problems, but there's also a lot of great things going on as well. I agree. Um, Peter, you've already been really generous with your time. If people want to, fo- uh, folks or listeners want to find out more about the work that you do or Horizon Kinetics or follow you or get more information, what's the best way to do that? Sure. We, we have a website, uh, horizonkinetics.com, and there's a lot of really interesting free research up there, um, you know, written a lot of it by my colleague, Murray Stahl, who's an absolute uh, brilliant mind. Um, and it's, it's a great way to get to know who we are and how we think. Um, and I tell anyone before you think about giving us any money to manage, you probably should read some of that research. And if you don't think that's of, of the highest quality, uh, makes your decision easier. Uh, but it, it, it really gives you an insight into kind of how we do the world. Awesome. All right, Peter. Well, thank you so much. Um, and we'll have to do this again uh, sometime soon. I've learned a lot. Michael, thank you very much.